So by now you've seen Moto Man's tech review and his first drive where I tried to help him actually explain what he was talking about in the tech review. Um, if there's anybody actually left who wants to know more, uh, here I am, I'm gonna tell you more. Um, so with the new TX9, we really focused uh, on real world performance, uh, much more than sort of your typical track test, zero to 60 uh, and catalog number kind of thing. Um, it turns out when you're developing an, an engine and a powertrain, what you have to do to get good zero to 60 times or what you need to do to get uh, a good peak horsepower that really looks impressive is often completely at odds with what you would need to do to make the car drive well in the real world. So it, we kind of had to just, uh, you know, pucker up and, and, and bravely ignore the catalog specs and just go for how the car actually drives in the real world. Um, so a good example of how that turned out is, is we actually have less horsepower uh, in this engine than we did on the previous CX-9, but vastly more torque. So we realized that uh, if you're looking for an engine that is responsive and direct when you make an acceleration on the freeway, for example, you just you get stuck behind a truck and you just want to pull around them. If you roll into the throttle uh, with a high horsepower engine that doesn't make a lot of torque, you can't make enough torque in sixth gear to do what you want it to do. Downshifts, doesn't quite do enough in fifth gear, downshifts again. And while you're waiting for all these downshifts, you keep pushing the gas pedal harder. And you finally gotten almost to the floor, it gets to fourth gear and you rock it away and you overshoot what you were trying to do. And you get into this cycle with the car where you're asking for more and it finally delivers and overshoots and you back off and you, you end up driving poorly. The car doesn't do what you want. It's a pretty unsatisfying experience, which is to say normal. That's what we're used to. Um, we wanted to design an engine that when you rolled into it in sixth gear, it could just make enough torque in sixth gear to do what you wanted it to do. Uh, so we built an engine that makes 310 foot-pounds of torque uh, at uh, 2,000 RPM uh, and can actually, below 2,000 RPM, still spool up and come up on boost just right from idle. Uh, so it doesn't even feel like a turbo engine. From idle, there's not enough exhaust energy to spin the turbo up uh, quickly. That's why we have turbo lag. Uh, you're starting this cycle where the exhaust drives the turbo, the tur turbo drives, pushes more air into the engine, that makes more exhaust energy, drives the turbo harder. That cycle takes a while to get going. So if we can spool the turbo up more quickly and get the thing up on boost, you won't feel any of that turbo lag. At low RPM, you can see on this manifold here, we have a set of ports uh, down here that we use at high RPM and a set of ports we use at low RPM. At low RPM, there's so little exhaust energy, if we force the exhaust through this tiny port, it's pretty much like putting your thumb over a hose where suddenly you take this water that's just dribbling out and you can shoot it across the yard at your sister. Um, that high velocity uh, then spools the turbo up more quickly and gets that cycle going and gets us up on boost and then we can open this up and have enough flow for, th for that higher RPM uh, performance. Now the other thing you'll notice that looks a little strange here is this is a four-cylinder engine and there's three exhaust ports. What's going on there? Um, this is the exhaust manifold from our naturally aspirated engine. All of our naturally aspirated Skyactiv engines uh, use this four into two into one bundle of snakes. What we're trying to do here is what we call exhaust scavenging. We want to get all of the exhaust out of the cylinder uh, at the end of the exhaust stroke so that it's not left over in the next, uh, uh, next intake stroke, creating heat and making, uh, making the engine more likely to knock. So, we have overlapping exhaust uh, events in different cylinders. The one exhaust uh, event is just ending, the next one is beginning at the same time. And you can have crosstalk in the exhaust manifold where that exhaust pulse from the new exhaust uh, where the valve is opening will start to interfere with the one that's closing. So this long bundle of snakes separates those pulses by enough space that that, that pulse can't go all the way down to the end and all the way back up and interfere uh, with the one that's closing before that valve gets closed. Now you notice we don't have that much room on the turbo engine. If we put a turbo all the way down here at the end of the manifold, there wouldn't be enough energy to get that boost cycle going. So we have to put the turbo really close uh, to the cylinder head. So we use a completely different strategy to achieve the same thing. By having only three exhaust ports, uh, we're using an effect uh, that's very similar to what you'd see in a paintbrush. Uh, uh, not a paintbrush, an airbrush. Paintbrush, you just do this. An airbrush, you know, when you put those cool graphics on your van, uh, that has a little bucket of paint with a straw coming up out of it, and you shoot a jet of air across that straw. There's nothing pushing the, the paint out of that can, but there's a suction created behind that jet of air as it goes over that straw that sucks the paint up into there. We're using exactly the same principle on the three exhaust ports here. Um, we have one exhaust valve just opened, has a lot of energy, it's going really fast. One exhaust valve that's about to close. Hardly any exhaust left in there, it's coming out really slowly. So if we have that high velocity flow 
creating a suction to pull that low velocity flow out, then we get our good exhaust scavenging. So by pairing the cylinders like this, the number two and number three together into one port, we're able to always at every cycle have our high energy flow next to our low energy flow. The firing order uh, in a four cylinder is one, three, four, two. This one's the front. So cylinder one, cylinder three, cylinder four, cylinder two, cylinder one. So yeah, it's always back, they're always next to each other. We're always going back and forth, outside cylinder to inside cylinder. So we always have our air and our paint right next to each other. So we can use this sort of airbrush effect to scavenge the exhaust. And that lets us run a higher compression ratio. This is a 10 and a half to one compression. On a very a high boost engine, it's running over 15 pounds of boost right off idle. Um, that, that's a, an, an impressive combination that could only be achieved through this kind of trickery. All right, so now that we've got all this torque, let's talk about putting it to the wheels. Um, the car comes in two configurations, front-wheel drive and all-wheel drive. Now, I've towed my Miata race car with the front-wheel drive version of this thing. It works surprisingly well. If you turn the traction control off, you can do a burnout all the way across the intersection while you're towing your race car, which honestly is pretty cool and one of the reasons not to get all-wheel drive. But if you're not into that, um, I active all-wheel drive system is, is very clever um, and uh, deserves a, a few moments of explanation. So the layout is very much like pretty much everybody's all-wheel drive system. You have front wheel drive driven all the t front wheels are driven all the time. You have a drive shaft that's driven all the time. And right in front of the rear diff, there's a, there's a clutch that we can disengage to make it front wheel drive. We can lock up to make it locked four wheel drive, or we can slip it any amount in between to make it any amount in between. Pretty much everybody does that. So what most all-wheel drive systems do is uh, they wait for the front tires to spin a little bit first, and then they engage the rear wheels. That's how they know they need to engage. The problem is, as the driver, you just lost control for a second, and then you gain it back. And we're not into that. We want you to have an absolute, complete control of the car at all times. So what we did was we tried to figure out how to anticipate that wheel spin, predict when it's going to happen before it happens, and engage all-wheel drive just enough to prevent those front tires from spinning. It turns out we have so much data in the car already from all the other systems that if we sort of mine all that data, we can, uh, we can figure out exactly what the traction is uh, outside the car and we can see the torque coming before uh, it actually comes because we see you hit the gas. We know how much torque we're going to deliver. So we can predict that wheel spin before it happens. So an example of sort of uh, how we can use the data we already have to predict what's going on outside the car. Very simple things like we have an outside temperature gauge on the dash we know what temperature it is. We know if it's freezing, it's a lot more likely to be cold. We know if it's raining. You know how we know that? If you turn the windshield wipers on, that means it's raining or snowing. So that's a pretty good hint. Uh, we know if you're on a hill, because if you're sitting still and we see positive G on the G sensor that the stability control uses, that means you're on an incline. On an incline, you have less weight on the front wheels, less grip, more likely to need all the drive to get you going. Um, we can also actually directly measure the amount of grip on the surface through two different systems. One, we can look at the steering. The electric power steering has torque sensors and steering angle sensors in order to work in the first place. If you're going around a corner and you hit a puddle, you notice how the steering gets light as you hit that puddle? We can measure exactly how light it is at a much higher resolution than you can and measure precisely how much grip is available by looking at that relationship between steering angle and torque. We can tell if you're on dry pavement, on snow, uh, or on wet pavement and, and react accordingly. Um, and then we can also watch the individual wheel speed sensors that are already there uh, for the ABS system. And we can look at very high resolution how much faster are the front tires going than the rear tires. Now, it turns out you always want the front tires going a little bit faster. In a front wheel drive car, there's a little bit of slip as the tire scrubs across the pavement and, uh, or across the snow or whatever you're on. The most amount of, uh, of torque that you're able to put to the ground is actually when the tire is slipping just a little bit. But it turns out we studied what, what can we identify with the computer and what can the driver identify uh, in terms of wheel slip. And we can recognize wheel slip way before the driver can. The driver doesn't recognize wheel slip until the acceleration starts tapering off but the revs are still building. And that's when the driver goes, hey, I'm, I'm losing control here. Uh, so in that range in between what the computer can see and what, what the driver can see, we can manage, to have, uh, manage the slip to have exactly the right amount, to have the maximum amount of grip and the least uh, fuel consumption. That's the other interesting side to this. If you're on wet pavement or on snow, it turns out it's more fuel efficient to be slightly all-wheel drive than it is to be fully, uh, fully front-wheel drive. Um, that tire slippage uses up a lot of, of energy. So if we can manage that slippage and reduce it by sending a little torque to the rear, we're actually more fuel efficient on slippery surfaces. The only problem with this iActive all-wheel drive really is that it works so well you have no idea what's going on. You never notice that it's there, that it's doing anything. As far as you know, you just had grip and, and everything was fine and you never needed all-wheel drive. Turns out you did. 
So the only difference in the all-wheel drive system uh, in the CX-9 from what we already have in the CX-3 and the CX-5 is the size of the components. The logic is, is pretty much exactly the same. But of course, the differential in a CX-3 being such a small, light car can, can fit in the palm of my hand, whereas you know, I might have to go to the gym first before I'm picking up the diff uh, from a CX-9. Uh, same with the power takeoff gears at the front where we're pulling the, 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 the drive off of the transmission and the, the drive shaft shape and all that. So that stuff is, has to be sized for the vehicle, but logic-wise, it's all very similar. So, so a good example of, of what I mean by a more intelligent uh, structure. Um, one of the most important things that the body has to do is protect the occupants in the event of a crash. So we're having to manage a huge amount of energy in, in that case. Um, the frame rails in the front of the car have to transfer load back into the body around the cabin and, and, and dissipate it out into the rest of the body. If there is a, a turn anywhere in one of these parts, say the frame rail comes back, hits the firewall, turns a little bit in line to line up with something else, that joint is especially weak. Uh, and then you have to throw a lot of extra mass at that part to make it strong enough to handle that job. So we put a lot of effort into making sure that the load paths are all very smooth and straight and they can transfer load efficiently without us having to throw extra, extra weight in there. So the, the frame rails underneath the car, uh, they have to start out in the front wide enough to go around the engine. Here they have to be wide enough to go around the engine but inboard of the suspension. In the back, the gas tank is quite wide underneath the, the rear seats and so it has to go out around that. Uh, instead of coming back to the gas tank and making a sharp turn around there, our frame rails are kind of diagonal underneath the car to have a very gradual uh, transfer of energy out uh, to the outside of the car like that. That's a much more efficient shape. Um, the front of the frame rails, instead of being a, a rectangle, is actually a plus shape because when you're crushing a, a, a structure like that, the strength is in the corners. And so the same amount of steel folded a few more times, we can get 12 points instead of four points. We have a lot more strength for the same amount of metal. So those kind of ideas multiplied across the entire car uh, can give you a much lighter and stronger structure without, without any extra weight or with less weight. So one of the, the benefits uh, of all this weight savings is a little bit surprising. We actually were able to use this lighter weight to make the car quieter. Uh, and the reason is we actually saved a lot more than 260 pounds in, in the structural changes on this car. And so we, that gave us some room to put weight back in. Now, nothing is more painful for a Mazda engineer than to put weight into a car. Uh, Motoman told you where I got married, so you know where my head's at in terms of weight. Uh, but we had enough uh, sort of headroom left on the weight budget that we actually put 53 pounds of sound deadening back in between the, the carpet and the floor in this car. Uh, for comparison, the old CX-9 had 17 pounds of sound deadening, which in itself was painful for us to put in the car. But that extra sound deadening, along with some acoustic glass in the front windows and a whole bunch of detail work on all the, the window seals and such, makes this by far the quietest car that Mazda's ever built. Uh, it's a very comfortable car to cruise in, talk to people all the way back in the third row, which is like a mile away from you. Um, so I think you'll really enjoy driving it. Um, my question for you as a nerd, uh, you obviously understand all I'm talking about with the, with the engine and with torque and low RPM response being so beneficial that you don't necessarily have to worry about the high RPM uh, power on this engine, uh, that you can have a turbo four outperform a V6 in a situation like this. What I'm wondering is if you think that the normal people who aren't nerds like us will, will get this uh, or, or if they're just gonna get fixated on the horsepower number. Um, I guess there's another question too, is, is, is whether, uh, whether you really did believe me or you're gonna have to wait to drive the car before you believe me, because either way, I'm right. Uh, so put the answers down here in the, uh, in the question things down here in the comments or whatever Motoman socials his media with, and uh, we'll see what you have to say.